Okay, it works. So one of the things that the uh, brothers put before us um, in our recent meetings um, as the leadership here is that uh, we ought to be looking at elders because we do have a number of fathers in this place and uh, that is entirely a scriptural and good question to ask and uh, we also decided that we would uh, teach about this for maybe the remainder of the month and then we would come back together at the next leadership meeting to look at what it might take to bring nominations so uh, I am trying to take that assignment uh, seriously and address it and uh, try to get to some of the questions that have been put before me. Also, give me other questions if you have them to address um, about you know what it takes to be an elder or what their role is or whatever else it might be. And I'll see if we can get all of that in before uh, we get to the end of the month and if more teaching is needed we'll do more teaching you know this is not crazy or anything uh, but we should set time frames and try to make them so that we can be productive in the Lord and so uh, I'm starting with this because I got to thinking uh, there's actually something rather obvious that, that needs to be said at the start and that I'm going to say, and so I don't want you to think that uh, I uh, am trying to get you or uproot some problem. It just occurs to me, we have to start at the start, really, <laughs> at the base here of the Bible, as what does the Bible really say, and what does it call for, and what do you read there, what does it hold? Because the Bible is right. The Bible is the answer. Um, so I think this needs to be said, and it's just a matter of us being very honest, uh, humble, and truthful with ourselves. And this occurred to me recently, maybe only recently, I don't know, maybe I've been saying something like it for a long time, but whatever. It seems like recently it has occurred to me that this is our estate and we've got to be truthful and reckon with it very directly so that we understand where we're starting from, right? Let's start here is what it is. You are here, right? We're on the map. You are here. This is where we are. Uh, so before we can get to particulars, if you will, about what it takes to qualify to serve or how to serve, or how to appoint those who are going to serve, which we hope to do. We first have to establish this baseline of, well, what are we trying to do anyway? <laughs> what is the point here? What are we trying to accomplish? And, and why are we trying to accomplish that? So the lesson is God intends for us to have elders. And the question is, do you? Now, what we find in the Bible is it's clearly God's intent that the churches have elders. That's how they are described in every place where they are described. We read of no other arrangement from God. There's You, you can't find it any other way in the Bible other than before they have elders and then they have elders. But And we'll look at that. Uh, we will be looking at that because, you know, right now we're in the before. But think about that. You know, the fact is that there are not other arrangements in the Bible. Right? The fact is, you don't see this ongoing presence of some whatever it is, some structure, some board, some committee, some group, cabal, business meeting, family meeting, whatever it is, all these various permutations of something that is not what God said to do. 
Right? In the final analysis, that's what happened. That's what's happening. It's not what God said to do. So it makes me ask this question, which is a hard question. And I say it's a question for myself as much as it is for anybody else. If I can read in Scripture that he always had them appointing elders and quickly and describes them in this way, then why do I see so many other organizations? Why are the churches that belong to Christ, the churches of Christ, so often led in some other way than by duly qualified and duly appointed elders? Just a question. Not saying anything about you or me or this church or that church, just in the abstract. Remember the Bible, that is our guide. The Bible is right. Remember that? New Testament Christianity. Let's do, speak where the Bible speaks and be silent where the Bible is silent. Well, you know where the Bible is silent? Business meetings, family meetings, overseeing boards, committees, right? The Bible is silent on that. Where does the Bible speak? It speaks on elders. This is fairly simple, and I don't mean to belabor it, but I want you to see it the way that I see it. Because, you know, I mean, what I have done, which is wrong, is think to myself, well, you know, yeah, I know that ideally we're supposed to have elders, but we don't have anybody qualified to serve as an elder, and so, you know, we're going to have to come up with something else. And so you think that that is okay for, what, 20 years? No, it's not. That's not okay. How long can you not do what God says to do? And that's all right. But that's what I'm realizing is, no, that's not going to be okay with God. I have to stop and wonder, maybe the problem is me. You know, you're thinking, well, we don't have anybody qualified. Yeah, maybe. But if you look at it and how long is it and how many people are fathers, is the problem maybe us, not God's word? Could it be that we're not doing what we're supposed to be doing? Why would we assume immediately that the pattern you read in God's word is not the right pattern? Or assume immediately that it can't be done? Maybe the problem is us. Maybe it should tell us something, shouldn't it? Shouldn't it tell us something? That's what I got to. Is it, This has to tell me something. The Bible does prescribe an arrangement. And it doesn't describe any others. And yet, that's the one that I see most infrequently. The one that the Bible actually calls for. You see that most infrequently. Why is that? That should tell us something. We've got something wrong. Something has to be adjusted. Something has to change. And it isn't God and it's not his word, right? Because think about it this way. If you read in the scriptures that they had them, well, why don't we have them? Is it because it's too hard to achieve what God said to achieve? Are we really interested in saying that it's too hard to be what God wants you to be as a church or as a father, or as a husband, as a, a parent? Is that really too hard? God's God's requirement is, is beyond our ability to, to do it or to achieve it? No, that's not true. People say that all the time, but it's not true. Is it that God hasn't been very clear about what he wants? No, it's not that either, is it? He has put a pattern out. He gave us what he wants. He told us what we're looking for. You see a pattern of elders in among the people in ancient times from, you know, from Moses, from before. No, it's, it's fairly clear what it is that he intends. Is it the case that that's an ideal perfection that we're not intended actually to realize, but just something to aspire to? Wouldn't it be great if... Nah, that's not how I read it. I read it as, no, you, you, uh, 
put things in order by appointing elders in every church as directed. That's what the Bible actually says, right? Is it the case, perhaps, that these are for somebody else to do? Now, it can't be that, well, this applies to other places, but not this place, because reasons. Mm, I don't think that's true either. That can't be the case. God's word is meant for all people in all situations. Or others, perhaps, are to make the sacrifices necessary to live the lives necessary to be the people necessary. Uh, no, we're called upon to live that way too. We're called upon to live right, to make these choices, to give effort in the local congregation to do the work. Yeah, it's not just for other people. And again, does his word contain the answer? Yeah, I think it does. I can't go down the path of, well, yes, this is what he, this is the pattern. Is that the pattern? Yes, it is the pattern. Is it what he prescribed? Yes, it's what he prescribed. Did he command his evangelists to appoint elders? Yes, he did. I can point to the verses, and we will. Yes, he did. So do we have to do that or not? Oh, well, I can't think of a way to get out of that one. I think we do. In fact, I know we do. It's fairly straightforward. Now, the reason for couching it in these terms and in, in, you know, the way that I couch it in these terms is because I'm trying to, th I'm trying to think about, well, how did I end up here? And I think that we ended up here with this false dilemma. A false, we think that we're in a dilemma as, as in, you know, we know what it takes to have elders and we're right about what we know. So we think this is us thinking, but, uh, you know, we just don't have any who are qualified. And so, you know, we're kind of stuck until we, you know, see more people come or circumstances change in the lives of the people who are here. And so we're thinking to ourselves, well, you know, you know, you, you, there's nothing worse than appointing elders who are evil, elders who are not qualified. Uh, and then, you know, you're, you're definitely going to have problems because you're going to be led by men who are unqualified. And I agree. You, there's no way to disobey God's word in that regard either. He did tell us how to qualify, who is faithful, who should be picked. And we have to follow that, of course. And I realize that people loosen that all the time just so that they can put some figureheads up there. Yeah, I know, that's not good. You don't want that. But, if you're thinking to yourself, well, that's the choice. We either have qualified, faithful elders, or we just don't have elders at this time. You are wrong. That is false. If that's what you think is happening, that's wrong. That's what I thought was happening, and I realize now that is wrong. The fact is, every church is currently being led by somebody. Somebody is leading the church at South Austin. That is the truth. There are leaders here. There are people who are leading right now. You say, but we don't have elders. Right, we don't have elders. But we're still being led. Well, how are we being led? Well, we're being led in ways that seem like they are the best that can be done in the absence of doing what God actually said to do and appoint elders. It's actually only one of two things. It's not elders or none. It's you have, you're being led by faithful elders or you are being led by unqualified elders. Those are the actual choices. All of the decisions, including the ones that are on the paper that we've given out and, and everything, I'm not trying to take away from, we're doing the best that we can in the circumstance, but all of the decisions that are being made are being made by basically every head of household in the whole congregation. 
whether they are married or not, whether they have children or not, whether their children are faithful, whether their spouses are faithful, that is not a, that's not a consideration as to whether you are one of the men who is part of the business meeting, the, the, the leadership meeting. Those things are not being considered. So the decisions are being made by, well, heads of household, all of them. What does that mean? Well, it means that in most cases, these are people who are not qualified to be elders. In mo you know, that's, that's how it is. People who are not married are making these spiritual leadership uh, decisions for the church. And yet the Lord clearly is calling for husbands and fathers to serve as elders. People who do, do not have family or have not raised their children or whose children don't fear the Lord are also part of the number. I mean, I'm not talking about any individual here. I'm just saying, think about it. When it comes to a leadership meeting, a business meeting in a local church, it's necessarily made of basically every male head of household in the whole congregation, whether he's married or not, whether he has children or not, whether his children are faithful or not. whether he's a new convert or not. That decision is being made by them. So the truth is simple. You have and you appoint faithful elders, and that's how you're being led, or you have and don't appoint unqualified elders, and that's how you're being led. That's how you're being led. The decisions we are making about whatever it is, times of services or... Well, I forget what else was on the list. That's why it's good to have a list, by the way. Thank you very much for writing that down, Andrew. But whatever the things that are being discussed, they're not being discussed by individuals who meet the qualifications we read about in 1 Timothy 3 or in Titus 1. They're being made by everybody who is male, head of household, member of the church. Sometimes the men who have, uh, you know, who have boys who reach an age of adulthood while they still live at home, those guys will also come. So you'll have 18, 19, 20, 21 year olds in the meeting as well, who are also not married, also do not have children, also do not have children who have become Christians. Are they qualified to serve as elders? Well, no, they're not. But they are serving as elders because they're part of the leadership meeting. They're making the decisions for you and me in this congregation. But that's the truth. It's not a question of, you know, do you have them or don't you? It's a question of who is leading. Are we being led by the organization God appointed? Or are we being led by something that is not what God appointed? That's it. If it's not being done, by the group of men, the eldership, appointed overseers by the Holy Spirit, as is worded by Paul in Acts 20, verse 28, then it is being done by unqualified elders. Necessarily. That's exactly what's happening. There's not an alternative. Decisions are being made. And, okay, and you might say sometimes. Okay, okay. <laughs> Fair enough, <laughs> but what do you expect from a group of unqualified elders? Can you expect better than that? I would like to, but you can't. There's no way to govern it because it's not in the Bible. There's no verses to point to. Fact is, the decisions are being made. They're being made by somebody, whether we like it or not. They're being made. There's not an alternative here. The church is being led today, right now, by somebody. Someone's leading. Who's leading? And who? how are they qualified to lead? That's the thing that we have to reckon with. What are we trying to accomplish here? If that makes sense. This is why I'm saying what I am about 
it's clear that the scriptures intend for us to be led in a certain way, a way that has been laid out for us carefully in scripture. That has to be what we're trying to achieve. We have to be working to get that. If it isn't the case now, and, and in this particular place, at this particular time, it is not the case, then we need to be getting to that spot. It has to be possible to do what God wants. It has to be possible to fulfill his commands. He gave no alternative arrangement, so we were really on our own coming up with other ways to do this. Yeah, it makes all kinds of trouble if we're not setting out to do what we read in the Bible, then what we settle for that's less than what you read in the Bible makes a whole lot of trouble for us. A whole lot of trouble. We joked earlier about decisions being slow or not <coughs> forthcoming. Okay. But there's truth to that. Sometimes decisions need to be a lot more timely. Sometimes they're, media, they're, they're just not important things. Color of the paint, whatever. But sometimes they're rather important, and yet consensus cannot be reached. And that's a problem. And it's endemic. It, it, it's intrinsic to an organization, an arrangement that isn't God's arrangement. There's little or nothing to be done about it. So we've got to get free of that by qualifying ourselves to serve and organizing ourselves the way that they did in the New Testament. Now let me take some verses quickly now, if you don't mind. But just for a minute, we, we stop and we say, look, that's kind of where we're coming from here. we got to wrestle with reality. Reality is, we're being led right now. Shouldn't it be the way that God wants it to be done? And cannot, can we not lay many issues, problems, troubles over the years at the feet of the lack of that kind of leadership? Yes, very clearly. Sound spiritual leadership would not have made the decisions that we have regrettably made in recent years. That is the truth. So we did the best we could, but it wasn't good enough. <laughs> it wasn't. Our decisions were not the kinds of decisions you would see if you did them in God's way. That's just the way it is. It's always that way. And we can see it so plainly when it comes to lessons about the organization of the church, church cooperation, uh, you know, instrumental music. So many of these that are considered basic fundamental lessons. You can easily see these hammers of, is God's way too hard? Is it impossible? Can it not be done? Is it not applying to us, right? That's easy to do when it's pointed at the Baptists, Right? But this is for us. Do we really think that we don't have to do what it says? That we don't have to follow this pattern that we find in Scripture? Why would you think that? So God's arrangement in Ephesus. Let's look at this. And I'm going to go kind of fast through these. Uh, for one thing, it's being recorded. Uh, for another thing, I have notes. I can share them with you. And, you know, I don't know if you're, you know, I don't know if you're reading as fast as I am anyway, probably a lot faster because I'm actually trying to speak it aloud and it's probably not too fast. All right. So here we go. Let's start at Ephesus. What started at Ephesus? Well, in Acts 19 at verse 5, uh, we see the very first time that Ephesus has Christians in it. Uh, arguably the first time they have Christians, at least in the way that we see it. There were people there who did believe in Jesus and understood a lot about him that was accurate. The Holy Spirit said that Apollos was eloquent in the scriptures and taught accurately the things of Jesus. 
although his knowledge stopped at the teaching of John. Apparently he left Judea while Jesus was still teaching, or maybe before Jesus started teaching. That's kind of what it sounds like. So he was accurately saying things about this Jesus and teaching, and that's what you had at Ephesus, was people who believed this and were looking for what's next, and Paul showed up with what's next. Well, what were you baptized into? He asked them in verse 4. Or, I'm sorry, at verse 3. And they said, John's. And Paul said, John baptized with baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in the one who's coming after him. That's Jesus. And on hearing this, verse 5, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Now they're Christians. If they weren't before, certainly they are Christians in the normal sense of the word today at this time. I understand that things were a little bit weird at first as the gospel was spreading for the very first time in the world. But you certainly see here the New Testament pattern of believing in Jesus, being baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Now they have Christians. It's Acts 19.5. Stick that one up there, 19.5. When you get to the next chapter, there's been an uproar over the teaching. There's been the riot around um, Artemis or Diana. When that's over, Paul takes off. Acts 20, verse 1. He sent for the disciples, encouraged them, and said farewell, leaving for Macedonia. So he left from here, went back kind of north, inland. And what we see here is they don't have elders yet. The reason for that is we know that it comes up in the letter that Paul sends to Timothy. First Timothy 1 Timothy 1.3, as I urged you when I was going to Macedonia, which we just read about, Acts 20, verse 1, remain at Ephesus so as to charge certain individuals not to teach any different doctrine. And there's quite a bit here in chapter 1 about different doctrines and different teachings and things. But the antidote for this in Timothy, as well as in Titus, is chapter 3, verse 1, the saying is trustworthy if anyone aspires to the office of overseer. He desires a noble task. The antidote to this is to get organized in God's way, have spiritual leadership in the congregation to deal with those who are teaching something that is not right. Hold to the sound doctrine of the word, and if anybody desires this, he desires a good thing. And he follows here in 1 Timothy 3 with the qualities that we are looking for in individuals who would serve. That tells us plainly that they don't have them yet. He also tells him, it's just for a time, 14 to 15. I hope to come to you soon, but I'm writing this to you so that if you delay, or I'm sorry, if I am delayed, you know still how you ought to behave in the household of God. Yeah, this is the order that God intends. So even if Paul <coughs> is delayed coming back, Timothy has the instructions he needs to put the elders in place to ensure integrity of the faith at Ephesus. There's also a warning in chapter 4 of the same letter. The Spirit expressly says, In later times some will depart from the faith, devoting themselves to deceitful spirits, the teachings of demons. Echoes of this come back in chapter 20. But he said, The Spirit has been very plain with us that, that you are going to have serious problems. They're going to depart from the faith he tells Timothy in 11 and 12, Command and teach these things. Let no one despise you for your youth, but set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. The commandment of the apostle for this evangelist Timothy, who is apparently a young fella, is command and teach these things. Let no one despise you for your youth, as in don't let them get around the fact that you are a young fella. You have the truth. You teach the truth. You bind the truth. When it comes to the elders, in the fifth chapter, he said, 19 to 21 here, do not admit a charge against an elder except on the evidence of two or three witnesses. 
As for those elders who do persist in sin, rebuke them in the presence of the rest of the elders so that they also may stand in fear. In the presence of God and Christ Jesus and the elect angels too, I charge you, keep these rules without prejudging, doing nothing from partiality. No personal favors here. Not a good old boys club. It's not his friends. It's about the truth. And in the sixth chapter of the same letter, where Paul left for Macedonia in Acts 20 and verse 1, he says in this sixth chapter, if anyone teaches a different doctrine, starting at verse 3, and doesn't agree with the sound words of our Lord Christ and the teaching that accords with godliness, this one is puffed up with conceit and understands nothing. He has an unhealthy craving for controversy, for quarrels about words, which produce envy, dissension, slander, evil suspicions, and constant friction among people who are depraved in mind and deprived of truth. Imagining that somehow godliness is a means of gain. Right, it isn't about personal gain, if that be money or if that be favor or whatever. It's not about that. But you notice this warning from him is that there are some who will arise. Earlier we read that the Spirit is expressed about people departing the faith. In 1 Timothy 6, he said, some arise with a different doctrine and will not allow the sound teaching of Jesus. <laughs> These are puffed up and understand nothing. These have unhealthy craving for controversy, quarrels about words. These imagine godliness as a means of gain. Now let me cut out from here for a moment. Go over to Titus, because uh, the instruction to Titus is fairly clear in this matter. We're going to come back to Ephesus, but look at how this is the same as what you read in Timothy. First thing is Titus 1.5, Titus, I left you in Crete. This is another Greek city-state, by the way. So when he left for Macedonia, he left Timothy at Ephesus, and he left Titus at Crete. And Titus was also traveling to the other Greek city-states, including Corinthians. That's why you read about him in, in the letters to the Corinthians. We're not going to go into Titus at the moment. But consider how it is the same. I left you there so that you might put what remained into order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. He goes on from here to give the instructions for how they are to appoint them, which is very similar to what you read. It's really just a paraphrase or a, another way of saying the same thing um, in the letter to Timothy. But it's clear in Titus 1 at uh, verse 9 that the elder, the overseer, must hold firm the trustworthy word as taught so that he may be able to give instruction in sound teaching and also to rebuke those who contradict it because there are many who are insubordinate, empty talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision. They must be silenced. They're upsetting whole families by teaching for shameful gain what they ought not to teach. It's the job of the elders to stop that. That's what they do. That's why you appoint them. Their job is to stop nonsense, to stop false teaching. He also told Timothy in chapter 2, 15, Declare this, exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no one get around you. Let no one disregard you. And, you know, this is what the Bible says. That's just the truth, all right? Sometimes people get mad at me, all right? I understand that. But the fact is, I have to insist on the book. It's my job. Before God, it's my job. I have to insist on the book. And there's no going around. It has to be the book. Titus was told this. Timothy was told this. Titus is also told in chapter 3, verses 8 and 9, 
avoid foolish controversies, which we read about in 1 Timothy 6. Genealogy, dissension, quarrels about the law, those are unprofitable and worthless. And then you have somebody there who persists in it in verse 10. He said, after a, a, after a warning or two or maybe three, leave that person alone. Have nothing to do with that one. So we have very clear instructions about what it is we're supposed to be doing. Why, one of the things that the elders are there to do. But yeah, that's where we left 1 Timothy 6. He gave him the formula for what to do. Now that was Acts 20 and verse 1 when Paul left, remember? He left Timothy there at Ephesus while he went to Macedonia. He writes this letter. And then in Acts chapter 20, 16 verses later at verse 17, he's traveling back. He's, he went up and did his thing in Macedonia and beyond. Now he's coming back, but he's not actually going to stop at Corinth, and he's not actually going to stop at Ephesus either. And the second letter to Corinth details why he didn't stop and how Titus was to be coming to them, etc., etc. That's all very interesting, and we'll talk about it, I think. But for today's lesson, think about this. Sixteen verses later, Paul on his way back gets close at Miletus and sends over to Ephesus calling the elders of the church to come to him. So they didn't have elders. Of course, they didn't have Christians until 1905 when they were baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. They didn't have elders when he left in 20 verse 1 and left Timothy there and left Titus in Crete. The pattern in Titus is, I left you there to appoint elders. It's clear that that's what's between the lines when he tells Timothy there's going to be falling away, and here are the qualities for those that desire to serve. It's clear why he's telling him that, especially in light of Titus. So now, 16 verses later, he can call to the elders of Ephesus. So Timothy did what he was told to do. He appointed them. Now Paul can call them. And listen to what Paul said to these elders in 28 to 32. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God which he obtained with his own blood. I know that after my departure fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And even from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore be alert, remembering, for three years I didn't cease, night and day, to admonish everyone with tears. Now I commend you to God and the word of his grace, because he just told them they will never see him again. He's going to Rome to die. What are you left with? You're left with God and the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. The words of Paul are incredible and still applicable for us. <coughs> the care for the church, which is the shepherding of the church, care and keeping, <laughs> accords with the fact that God obtained it with his own blood, the blood of his son. It is the most precious thing that there is. It's got to be treated that way by people who genuinely care about God, who genuinely care about other Christians, who genuinely care about truth. Pay careful attention to yourselves as well as the entire flock among which the Spirit has made you overseers. When Paul left Timothy or Titus in a place and gave him the instructions by which to appoint the elders, saying, appoint the elders in every city, and they did that, these men who were serving as elders in those places, Paul says, were actually appointed by the Holy Spirit. 
Is it because of a miracle? No, it's because the Holy Spirit inspired the instructions in 1 Timothy 3 and in Titus 1. And if we appoint according to those instructions, then we're subjecting ourselves to the teaching of the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is the one who is appointing the elders. And Paul knew that he was leaving, dying, but there would come wolves who would not spare the flock among the church itself and from among the elders themselves. Even their own leaders are going to have this problem. And that sheds, you know, or I guess that is something you think back on 1 Timothy 5 about the elders that persist in sin rebuke in the presence of all. There's going to be some. But he didn't say, therefore, do not appoint elders. You guys step down. No, he didn't say that. I know some of them are going to do wrong. Yes, some of them are going to do wrong. They shouldn't be doing that. I understand that. But that doesn't mean you don't have elders. That doesn't mean you don't appoint them. Husbands sometimes do wrong, but that doesn't mean that they just get to not lead their family. Fathers do wrong, but that doesn't mean children can disobey them. And we don't throw away the office that God set up, the arrangement that God set up, just because sometimes the person or persons who hold that office do wrong. Yeah, sometimes they do, but that doesn't mean you don't have heads of household. That doesn't mean you don't have parents. That doesn't mean you don't have leaders. What you do, what it means is you be alert. How long had he been there? Three years he spent with them teaching while he was there. How long has he been gone? Eh, not that long. Some months, maybe. You look at the events in Acts 20 between 1 and 17. Eh, some months. These fellows have been Christians for probably less than four years. But he's warning them be alert, it's coming. And they're commended to the word. That's what all of us have today. We don't have apostles walking among us. We don't have miracles bearing witness or testimony to the teaching that's being done. We are commended, just as they were, to, the, to God and to the word of his grace. We, every congregation gives answer directly to God. That's the organization that God has in place. It's the thing that he set the evangelists to doing when these places were established. Man, we are out of time. But consider again, God intends for the churches to have others. And is that your intent? To see to it that we find the ways to make this be the case. If we find that we're not qualified, well, what will it take to qualify? And how do I do that? How do I become that? That should be the attitude. Not the, oh, I don't want that one. Well, and maybe there's reasons, but what are those reasons? Because that's a different problem, right? <laughs> maybe something's wrong, but if something's wrong, well, we should do something about that. <laughs> Whether they're thinking about being elders or not. If you have somebody here who is not the husband of one wife, who has multiple wives, we need to do something about that. We have somebody here who lets his children worship Satan at home on the weekends. We should do something about that. Right? Somebody here who is a drunkard, who's known for getting in fights. There should be no Christian who is known for those things. If there's a problem, we need to deal with the problem. And you look at the list of things that they're required to be, there's not anything on that list that you aren't required to be. I mean, you don't have to get married to be right with God. I understand that. You don't have to be a parent to be right with God. I understand that. But if you do marry, you have to be monogamous. You have to be faithful. You have to lead your household well, husband. And if you do have children... You have to teach them what is right and keep them under control, Dad. Everybody does, not just people who want to be elders. 
Everybody has to live that way. And all the other stuff in the list, no fighter, no drunkard, uh, you know, not accused of crime, not allowing uh, criminal activity in his own household. Yeah, no Christian should be doing any of that stuff. So let's get down to it, you know. Let's get real about appointing elders and following through in God's word and see the benefit that comes from it, the growth of the congregation. All right. Today, are you a Christian, a child of God? You saw a progression of what happened in those places and how they came to a place of maturity, a place of safety, a place of protection under the oversight of God's elders to the best of our ability. <coughs> that path of maturity is one that starts the way that it did in Acts 19.5 with believing in Jesus and being baptized in his name for forgiveness of sins. Ephesians 4 tells us there is one Lord, one faith, one baptism. So the church at Ephesus, though they had been baptized into John, they knew that the one baptism was the baptism of Jesus Christ. And Peter had said as much in Acts chapter 10 when the Holy Spirit fell upon Romans for the first time. He said, Who can forbid water that these should be baptized? And commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for forgiveness of sins. Today we have water prepared that you might obey the gospel. You realize your soul's lost a state. Are you a Christian who has not lived right? Repent, make things right with God, pray for forgiveness in the heart by all means, and quickly. But if we can help with our prayers, we're glad to do it because we all need prayers. If you need today the prayers of the saints, if you need to obey the gospel, let your spiritual need be known by coming to the front at this time while together we stand and sing the song selected. <coughs> 